Testing, one, two, three, testing, testing. We're going to talk about Zen Framework 3 today. My name is Matthew Wiro Finney. I go by MWAP. I'll have contact information up here later for you in case you have questions. I very excited to be here. Uh, I have worked for Zen for almost 10 years. I visit the office once every oh, two or three years. So it's kind of fun to be out here in California again, especially since it's really, really cold where I live in South Dakota. So this is a fantastic climate right now. I could go outside and run in shorts and be happy. We're going to talk about Zen Framework 3, and I want to talk to you about first what to expect. And the first thing to expect is that it's not going to be as bad of a migration as you might think. How many went from one to two? A few of you, okay. How was that? Very painful. Yeah, brutal, okay. Uh, the Zen Framework 2 MVC is not going away. So that's the first thing I want you to take away here is that if you're developing in Zen Framework 2, that's going to continue. You're still gonna be able to use it. Um, what we are going to do though is a kind of a radical direction for Zen Framework and yet it's a returning to our roots. The first thing we're doing is we are moving back to an emphasis on components. Zen Framework has always been a component-driven library that happens to have an MVC framework, except for at a certain point, we emphasize the framework more than the components. We're going back to that, and we're gonna talk a lot about that tonight. The next part is that we are going to focus a lot more on HTTP, in particular, PSR7, which I will talk about shortly here. Uh, PSR7 is shared HTTP message interfaces, and uh, we're gonna be focusing on that and a concept called middleware, and if you don't know what that is, you'll know a lot by tonight. And then finally, we are going to be updating the minimum required version. Right now we're at 5.3.23. We're gonna be moving up to 5.5. That will be the minimum. Uh, that's because even 5.4 is going end of life pretty soon here. So we need to be keeping up to date. We're also gonna be optimizing for PHP 7, which is supposed to come out at the end of the year. So we wanna make sure that we're gonna run really, really well on there. We've had our first steps on that. The Zen Framework 2 test suite is running on it right now. Zen Framework 1 test suite is actually just about there as well. So we know it should work, but we're gonna try and optimize for it. And I'll tell you how in a bit. So this is what to expect. That's what we're talking about tonight. Feel free to jump in and ask questions. Uh, the people who are watching on the recording don't get that opportunity, so you guys are lucky. So <laughs> please do. First thing I'm gonna talk about tonight are components. So in the past, a few of you, how many have used Zen Framework 1? Pretty much everybody, okay. So the past was that we were doing components. That's what the framework was built on. Components were all in the repository. If you wanted to use Zen ACL, how did you use it? You installed the entire framework. <laughs> so very cool that we had all these great enterprise level components, but the only way to consume them was to use the entire framework. And back then we were using SVN, which meant that you add in an SVN external and you had to wait for an hour or two for everything to download depending on your network speed, right? So it didn't make it for a very viable component framework if you really only wanted one or two components. Things are a little bit better in Zen Framework 2. We're still developing the components as part of the repository, which means they all jump version at the same time, even if there's no changes. So, for instance, Zen Paginator typically doesn't need changes from version to version. Occasionally we have some changes in one of the adapters, but most of the time we don't. And yet it's getting bumped every version, even if there aren't any changes. Um, this has caused a problem because the way that we are distributing the components is we actually have a semi-manual, semi-automatic process that <laughs> we run after we tag the main repository to sync the changes in and it becomes very problematic in terms of making sure the history is kept and everything. We actually ended up dropping history for these and just tagging them based on the version. Um, the other problem that we have is when people are submitting issues against the component repositories and we can't then port that stuff easily over to the main repository. So it's a maintenance problem for us. But you can install them individually, which is a really nice bit. It's an improvement over Zen Framework 1. That's great, we like that. So the future, and you'll see that I'm not mentioning Zen Framework 3, it's 2.5. We're preparing 2.4 right now, but as soon as 2.4 is done, we're going to make a big step, and that's going to be to separate all the components into their own repositories. That means all the code, all the tests, all the history, 
all the tags are going to go into their own repositories and they're now going to have their own life cycle. Which means that you can install them individually just like you do today, but you'll be able to install every single version of 2.x onwards, which is really nice. It also means that we can do a few new things such as change Zen Framework itself. And Zen Framework is no longer going to be this library, it's going to be a meta package that goes and installs all the dependencies for you. So the composer JSON will look something like this. For 2.5, and we're not even sure yet if we're going to tag Zen Framework as 2.5 uh, or not, but at 2.5, we'll be able to have a version of Zen Framework out there that looks something like this, and it's just going to pull in all the components for you. And that means we can package very easily. We just pull them all in from that version and create a package, and you're ready to go. So why? <laughs> this is a big question. Why are we doing this in the first place? First off is to ease maintenance. I have a small team, <laughs> really small team. <laughs> I've also got a huge team. My small team is at Zend. And we're able to do a lot of stuff, but we're also splitting our time between Zen Framework and AppAgility and other projects. And so maintenance becomes a problem. I don't want you guys to have to wait on me. So we created, with Zen Framework 2, this idea of a community review team. And this team goes and helps us merge things. But they are all like you. They all have jobs. They're busy every day. Sometimes people have a lot of time. Uh, I know a few of the people on the review team when they have vacations, they don't have family obligations or anything. They spend all their time merging, which is great. But that is sporadic. And we want to be able to enable a greater number of people. So one of the things that we want to do is be able to give more people commit rights. We can't do that when we're having to worry about whether they're committing against the entire framework. We had this problem in Zen Framework 1 where people were showing that they're really good at, say, for instance, cache. But then they're going and committing changes to say for instance DB, where they may or may not actually know all the ramifications, but they have commit rights, so it works. That's a problem. We want to make it so that, yes, you can commit, but we want you to be able to commit to something that we've shown expertise in. And we can do that if we separate out into components. It also allows us to do a selective evolution. Like I said before, we can choose whether or not they're going to continue, but the other part is we can choose which ones are going to bump new features. We have three or four components right now that are really need to have some major rewrites happening for performance reasons, for flexibility reasons, whatever the case may be. Things like the event manager, like service manager, need to have some major changes. Other components are perfectly stable where they are right now. Why would we bump their version just because something else changed API? So that's one of the pieces that we want to address. Because the framework becomes a meta package, we can actually pin it to specific versions. So we may know that it works with version 2.5 of the service manager, but 3.0 introduces problems. So we may say, OK, we're not going to upgrade to 3.0 in the main framework repository yet. We'll wait on that. But it, the nice part is that the, the component itself can continue to evolve even though the framework is opting not to take that evolution, which is a really nice thing. It also allows us to do some more use case specific features. So if you're doing, for instance, just web services, maybe you're doing just XML RPC or SOAP or JSON RPC, there is no reason for you to have the entire framework. But you might want to have something like the service manager and the event manager still. We can create a skeleton for some of these common use cases. Another thing is you might really be worried about performance. So you might want to say, you know what, I want a version that doesn't include the MVC, doesn't include the service manager or the event manager, but I have everything else at my mercy. You know, I can go in and do whatever I want. So that might be another use case. And then again, you might want everything, right? <laughs> you might want the kitchen sink. We can have different skeletons for that. We've already started with that with AppAgility. AppAgility has its own skeleton. It removes some of the features like translator and that sort of thing that are not relevant to the API development, but are very relevant still to the general use case. This will make it even easier. So what it comes down to is components are going to make it easier for us to maintain the framework and evolve it going forward because we'll be able to expand the number of people who are able to commit. We're going to have greater flexibility in terms of installing 
greater flexibility in terms of having skeletons for your different use cases, etc. It also means that we'll likely have wider adoption of Zen components, which helps all of us, right? Because we can all continue to get jobs. We can use the expertise we already have to get the better work for ourselves. So we get wider adoption because we separate things out. So that's something that we're really excited about. So I told you there were three things we're talking about tonight. First one was components. The next one is HTTP, PSR7, and middleware. What does all this mean? Well, let's go through it one by one. The first is HTTP. HTTP is the foundation of the web. It's the protocol by which everything is transferred around. All that markup that you're doing, all the API payloads are being transported over HTTP. A client sends a request. You on the server side send a response right back to them. These are called messages. You have a request message, and it looks like the first one up there, the first line is what's called the request line that has the, uh, the request method, a target, in this case it's a path, but it can be a, a number of different things, and it has the protocol version, followed by one or more headers, key value pairs, we've all worked with these, and optionally a body, depending on what the request method is. A response starts with the protocol version, you have your status code, your reason phrase, this is the status line, and then it's the same pattern, headers, message body. We all know this stuff, right? The problem is, this stuff is not exposed easily in PHP, is it, right? PHP targets a server API, which is based on the CGI specification, and we have all these great super globals, which are impossible to test against, <laughs> and it's very difficult to get at some of the easy parts, like headers, how do we get at those? There's actually three or four different ways to get at those in PHP, and depending on your use case, you might have to use certain ones versus other ones, it's a pain. Request method is pretty easy, but the request URI depends on whether or not you're behind a proxy server, what server you're running, and uh, what ports you're running on. Uh, it might have to do whether or not the URL is encoded. There's something like seven or eight different sources you have to look at in order to generalize code that will get the request URI for you. It's pretty, uh, pretty crazy. So what we do in frameworks is we model these messages for you. We abstract that away and give you a model. But every framework does it differently. So one might say get, re get method. Another might say get request method. Another might just use a property. <coughs> Symphony. Uh, anyway, <laughs> my point is this makes it really hard for us to interoperate. In App Agility, we have the OAuth support in there. For that OAuth support, we rely on OAuth 2 server PHP. It's a project out there. It has its own request and response pro um, methods. For us to work with it, we have to marshal our request into their request type, and then take their response and marshal it back into our own response type so that we can actually do things. This is crazy. I want to be able to interoperate easily. So. To that end, for the last five months, I think, <laughs> I've been working with the Framework Interop Group, a group I said I would never touch again with a 10-foot pole, but I felt strongly enough about the HTTP stuff that I really wanted to do something. And PSR7 has been in the works for a little over two years now, and it's shared HTTP message interfaces. It's exactly the sort of thing that I think we need to have in PHP. I would like to see this at the language level, like they have in uh, Ruby with Rack, or Python with WSGI, or Node with its HTTP responses and requests. But baby steps. We start with a shared specification. This goes into voting phase tomorrow, so I'm really, really excited. <laughs> um, what it comes down to is we have a shared interface. And so now every single library that opts into PSR7 is going to look the same in terms of how do I access the members of a request or how do I write to my response? It becomes a really, really easy thing, and now I can take those same messages and pass them around to different libraries, and they all interoperate. I don't have to learn how to marshal from one to the other, I just pass my messages on. And that's what I really want to get going. So how, what does this have to do with Zen Framework? <laughs> so, most likely, we're going to do something with PSR7. I, obviously, I've been involved with it. I want to see this happen, right? It's still under discussion because there's a lot of little details. One is that we can just adopt PSR7 outright. 
backward compatibility break all over the place because it's a completely different API. At the same time, we then know that we interoperate with anybody else using PSR7, which would be awesome. If we don't want to break backwards compatibility, we may have to do a bridge or a proxy implementation. Uh, one of the problems we have is that a couple of our methods overlap but have different signatures, which is problematic for many obvious reasons. We'll figure out something. So the MVC is going to start using PSR7, but that's not all that interesting. What's interesting is that when you start having first-class support for HTTP, there's a pattern that begins to arise, and that pattern is called middleware. Middleware is code that sits between the request and the response. With many of the implementations you see in other languages, they don't actually have a concept of a server API. So they have code that acts as an HTTP server, and they delegate their code, they marshal a request and a response, and pass it on to your code, and they do it through what's called middleware. This is the most basic idea of it, is that we have a request and a response patched to it, and you return a response back. And that's all there is. Now, there's a variety of ways that this will actually work. But it's a really easy, easy pattern. And if we can start thinking in terms of middleware, we can do a whole bunch of stuff, especially if we have common request and response interfaces, because now we can start writing web-facing widgets that are framework agnostic, and we can drop them into any framework, which can consume them. And Zen Framework can be one of those. So there's a variety of types of middleware. One are stacks or pipelines. How many of you have done Node? Okay. How many of you used Connect or Express? This will look familiar. <laughs> it's used there instead of pipe, but uh, I'm using pipeline here because it's the same concept that you have in Unix. So we have a pipeline, and we pipe to one middleware. We might pass a path and say, only execute if this path is matched, which is a really nice way of optimizing your application because now you don't have to load everything up front. You only load if that path is matched, which is a really nice thing. And then you go and you add all of these, and you emit, you listen, and you get something out of it, right, based on what the request was. So this is one way to do it, is piping. Another type is what I call the onion. This is uh, typified by Rack. Uh, if you've looked at Stack PHP, it's the same, similar idea. You pass in an app or another middleware, and when you execute yourself, you go and you execute that other middleware and on down the stack. So maybe the inner has another one inside of it and another one inside of it. So you're peeling back the layers, and each one returns a response until it bubbles back on out. Interestingly, you can do both styles in the same application. And if you play with Express or Connect, it actually does an onion style in order to do routing and uh, view templates. But it also allows you to execute them in a linear fashion if you want to. There's another style called the Lambda style, where you pass a request, and its job is to return a response. How many of you have looked at Laravel 5? It does this. Right? That looks very familiar. Uh, actually, it's funny. Uh, Taylor Otwell actually came in on the PSR7 discussion and weighed in and said he really liked the idea, but he was releasing earlier than PSR7 was likely to get adopted. So Laravel 5 does not target PSR7. It will be a matter of days, I'm sure, before there's a wrapper once we get voted. So it's pretty cool. So Lambda style is another style. Essentially, what I'm getting at is that they're very simple concepts. And there's a lot of composability in these concepts, which allows you to do a whole lot of things simply and quickly. It's a pattern that is designed for both beginner users and power users. And it's something I really, really like about it. So again, going back to this, what does this have to do with Zen Framework? And what it has to do with is that we're going to be allowing you to consume middleware via Zen Framework's MVC. So we'll be able to say, hey, if you support this style of middleware, we can do this. And the cool part about middleware is that if you have different styles, it's very easy to wrap one style in another in order to pass it on. So you put it in a closure, or you have some sort of proxy object, and you go from there. Zen Framework controllers will then themselves be middleware. In fact, today they already are. How many of you actually know what the base interface is that defines a controller in Zen Framework 2? I know somebody has to, right? Anybody? Abstract controller? No, it's not the abstract controller. That's on framework one. 
<laughs> but we do have abstract controllers, but that's not the base. It yeah, it goes deeper than that. So a Zen standard lib dispatchable interface. It looks exactly like this. The patterns have been around for a long time. We just thought, we didn't realize that they were middleware until later down the line when we started seeing the pattern elsewhere in other languages. So that'll be one possibility. The other possibility is that we're going to offer wrappers for your Zen framework applications so that they can be executed as if they were middleware. This gives you your migration path. In fact, it gives you a migration path for Zen Framework 1 to Zen Framework 2, and either 1 to middleware if you want to use it, which is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, this is pseudocode. Don't expect this to work. There's going to be a lot more to it. <laughs> but the basic idea is that we have this middleware wrapper, and you pass it your configuration for your Zen Framework 2 application, and now it's going to go and initialize the application. If this gets executed, then it can do all of its work. Otherwise, you've just configured your application. That's it. But it can be listening on a subpath of your entire site, and you can have other things composed in next to it. Very fun stuff. So that then leads to another possibility is, well, why do we need the MVC? Well, the MVC that we have in Zen Framework 2 answered a whole lot of questions. The reason we built it was a lot of people were going from Zen Framework 1 and said, you know, this is great. It's too simple. There are complex needs that I have that this does not answer. I need to be able to plug into any aspect of it. So we looked at that. They also said, well, I need to be able to change what gets executed based on what's been requested. OK. So we built things like the event manager and the service manager. They have very specific purposes, and those purposes aren't going away. But it's not for everybody. The MVC in Zen Framework 2 is very complex, very detail-oriented, very hard for newcomers to come into. Excellent for people with some experience under their belt who understand the different architectures and the different patterns. So why not offer another runtime that might be game geared toward a little simpler use case? If I'm only doing a small website with a few different things, why can't I just execute middleware? So that's something I want to look at. So performance is going to be one of those pieces. If I only have a few items in there, why would I fire up this entire framework? If I have a few static pages and a few pages that are doing things, maybe it's a contact form. Let's take a look at my website, mwap.net. I've got a contact form. I've got a static blog. I've got my resume. And I've got a, uh, one page that I have password protected. Do I need an entire framework for that? Probably not. So why would I choose something that has a lot of performance overhead? I might not need to. The other thing is developer experience. I don't necessarily want to have to learn all the patterns of a framework in order to be able to use it. I don't necessarily want to learn about the event manager if I'm not going to be using it, if it's just an implementation detail, right? If I can have something simpler, I'm going to go to that. This is why projects like Laravel tend to flourish, right? It's not because it's bad code. <laughs> it's because it caters to that beginner mindset and makes the easy things easy, right? It also means the hard things are really hard. But that's what the Zen Framework 2 MVC is for, right? To make the hard things easy, but then we can make the easy things easy as well. It also gives us that reusability across frameworks. If our controllers are middleware, and if I can write to middleware as one of the things, the options that the framework gives me, that means if I decide later I want to use Slim, or later I want to use uh, Symfony, or perhaps another team is doing an application in one of those frameworks and I need to integrate, I can still do that. And I don't have to give up my Zen framework components. So as an example, this is a fun one. I've got a home page which might be mostly static. There might be no, no actual computation going on there, just executing a view. I might have Zen Framework 2, and I've got a whole slew of things there that I've done under customer, because I'm using Doctrine. And uh, so I'm using Doctrine integration in Zen Framework 2, and I've gone and done that. But I have a legacy area of products that came from an older application. That's in Zen Framework 1, and I wrap that in middleware. I put it in there. I've got my API, which I, of course, wrote in App Agility, right? And I put that in there. And I've also got a user area that's a third-party middleware. Maybe it's uh, the equivalent of ZFC user, but it's written using just plain old middleware that somebody else wrote. 
and I can compose all of these into the same application with a little bit of teasing. I can even make it so that these lazy load their resources only if they're invoked and everything's hunky-dory. So this is where I want to go. So that's what Zen Framework 2 is really, really about is PSR7 and middleware because they give us a whole lot of benefits. It gives us paths for performance optimization that we didn't have before because we we're always loading all the different resources for the framework right off the bat. Even if it wasn't the resources for your particular path because you have the service manager in place and you can lazy load all those, you still have somewhere in the range of one to 200 objects being loaded. And the execution time for that currently, before you get to PHP 7, is quite high. So now what we can do is we can optimize performance a little bit more. We can have simpler web facing interfaces. I can write a contact form using plain vanilla middleware and have it execute across any application that's capable of executing middleware, which is awesome, which gives me greater interoperability. And I can write code that's simpler because the base idea is simply a request and response and I return a response, that's it. I can learn that in a few seconds. I can glance at one slide and understand how it works. So that's the big news for Zen Framework, is right here, HTTP facing middleware. Now the third point, remember there were three. We had components, we had HTTP, third one is PHP 7 and PHP 5. So every time we update the minimum required version, uh, we get a subset of people who yell, saying, but no, no, I can't update for the next X number of years because it's policy, to which I say, yeah, but your policy is leaving you with insecure PHP versions that don't perform as well. So <laughs> this is a stupid policy, right? Uh, the other part is it leaves us behind. We have code that we could get rid of right now, except for we have to support older versions. So why do we move to PHP 5? Uh, first off, 5.4 is going end of life very soon here. It's uh, in the next few months. So it doesn't make any sense to target 5.4. 5.5 and 5.6 will be around for a little while. 7 is coming around at the end of the year. So we want to get to a point where when this releases, it's going to be on something that's still supported. So we'll go to 5.5. But upgrading to 5.5 gives us a whole slew of new features that we can use. We can use traits, which some people deride, and I don't quite understand why, because all it is is compiler-assisted copy and paste, which means I can write the code once and you use it in about X billion other places. I did it with FlyHTTP, and it decreased the amount of code I had to write by, um, by a factor of two, which is on just really awesome. We get to use shorter array syntax, so our config files are shorter and easier to read, <laughs> which all of us who do Zen Framework 2 understand. <laughs> we can use the callable type hint, which means that our event manager actually can become a whole lot simpler because we don't have to be testing for our callables. Um, this is going to be a really nice thing actually for a lot of things. Uh, we get to use finally, which may not seem like a big deal, but when we're looking at things like the uh, uh, error handling within the MVC, this is actually going to be really, really nice because we can go through and catch a variety of different errors and then have one final error handler, or rather exception handler in there. Uh, we have password hashing shims because, of course, we needed to have the ability to do secure passwords. It's built into 5.5, so this is going to be very good. Uh, the class magic constant is going to become very useful, especially when we start going into um, service manager changes where we're going to start using fully qualified class names as a typical key. We can just import the stuff and you say class, which is great. So you say uh, event manager colon colon class, and now it resolves everything. We get to use generators, and those are going to be nice, especially with the event manager. It'll reduce code that we have to write. And we get faster, more secure PHP. Everybody benefits from that. All of your code benefits from that. So why wouldn't we update, right? The essential takeaway from this is that by upgrading to PHP 5.5, we are going to be able to improve the code quality and reduce the amount of code that we have to maintain. So why wouldn't we do this? The other thing we're going to do is we're going to optimize for PHP 7. Now, what does that mean exactly? The first thing is I'm running tests against the scalar type hints patches that we have. The, how many of you have been following this debate at all in PHP internals? I feel sorry for you. <laughs> it's been painful. Uh, there's actually, so scalar type hints. 
Right now we can do type hints against objects, array, and uh, callable, right? Scalar type hints are going to allow us to do things against int, against string, against um, Boolean, and uh, what's the other one? Uh, float, right. We're going to be able to do against any of the different scalar types, which is going to be awesome. The two competing uh, type uh, RFCs that we have going, one uh, that's a slight coercive that uses the current rules in PHP today, but then offers an optional opt-in per file mode, uh, strict mode. And when that's in, if it's not exactly of that type, it bails early and gives you an exception. Um, the other one, uh, Zev uh, Sarasky from Zend is actually spearheading is a coercive one, kind of like the, the previous one, except for it has stricter rules about the coercion uh, and is actually trying to do so in a way that's going to make it more um, uniform across the entire language. When you're in a strict mode or using this new coercive mode, you get all sorts of fun errors, like you discover that you're passing a Boolean where they're supposed to be an integer constant. Uh, you find out that you're passing um, a float where they're supposed to be an integer and things like that. I've run against those. I've got reports of where we're doing that. So we can go and change our code today in PHP 5, make it more correct, which means that we get better quality code today that also runs on PHP 7 flawlessly. So that's one of the optimizations we're doing. The other one uh, we're going to be doing, uh, looking at actually, is automating our release builds. Right now we do our parameter hinting and our return hinting all through annotations, right? How cool would it be to be able to actually use scalar type hints for that? That'd be awesome, right? Unfortunately, we can't do that if we're targeting 5.5, but we may be able to do some automated release builds that go and change the code in line and put in those scalar type hints for us so that we can have a PHP 7 and a PHP 5 version for you to run against. That'd be pretty cool, right? It's actually really, really easy to accomplish. And of course, we're going to be profiling in PHP 7 as we go. There's some really cool optimizations in there. How many of you have seen the benchmarks for 7? A handful of you? It is way faster. Now, the cool part is you look at things like WordPress and it's like 20 times faster. You look at a framework code and it's like 40 times faster. And it's because of most of the optimizations are going into how they do ZVALs, which include how they're doing objects and how they're storing them. And I mentioned before, the object graph and framework applications, especially version two, are really huge. Now, they can still be huge, but they're using a very small amount of resources. And so it's a lot faster. So we're already getting a whole lot of performance out of PHP 7 out of the box with no changes, but we're going to be doing some more profiling to see if there are areas that we could get even better performance and uh, looking at that as we go forward. And part of that's going to be a, going back to PHP 5.5 and saying, hey, can we use things like regenerators that can reduce the amount of memory that we're using and operate faster than normal iterators? So this comes down to PHP and raising the minimum version and thinking forward to the versions we want to continue supporting is going to give you better security because you're going to be on top of the later, latest versions. You're going to be getting your security updates and you're going to know that you're safe going forward. You're going to get improved performance. If you've looked at any of the uh, uh, benchmarks over the years, you know 5.3 to 5.4 was a big boost. 5.4 to 5.5 to 5 was a boost. To 6 was a boost. Going up to PHP 7 is going to be a huge boost. So you're going to have improved performance because we're updating the version. The next part is that updating PHP allows us to improve the framework, reduce the amount of code we have to use to make the framework work, which means that we can maintain it a bit easier, which means all of you benefit, right? And those of you helping us maintain it, it's an easier job for you. So that's one of the big moves as well. So I'm actually running really fast tonight. <laughs> Uh, and I'm, I'm kind of glad because you guys will be able to ask questions and I'll be able to uh, see what I need to do better in here. But summing things up comes back down to those three things. The first one is components. Zen Framework 3 will be a true component library built with Composer in mind, and it's going to give you some benefits that you don't have today. And one of those key benefits is going to be that you are going to get more up-to-date code, better maintained code, because there's going to be more people capable of helping you and helping us maintain it. ZF3 is going to be a truly HTTP-centric framework. 
Yes, we'll have tools like the console tooling and everything in there, but when it comes down to it, we're PHP developers, we're building for the web. So let's build for HTTP. Let's understand how HTTP is modeled. Let's have good, solid interfaces that we're working against. And we're going to be able to continue using this wonderful enterprise stack that we have, but we'll be able to do it with an optimized middleware runtime either beside it or in parallel or as part of the stack. And we're going to be moving to the future of PHP, which is not supporting these legacy versions of PHP that are no longer supported even by PHP.net. We're going to be saying, hey, let's move forward, keep on top of the latest PHP versions, use the greatest options that they have to give you, and you get a more secure and more performant PHP out of it and more secure, more performant applications out of it, which everybody benefits from. So that's where we are today. My name again is Matthew Rero Finney. I'm MWAP on Twitter. You can reach me at framework.zen.com or appagility.org. And if you are really wanting to stalk me, MWAP.net. <laughs>